Hi there, and welcome back. This is day number 80, where we read Numbers 19 and 20, our second reading in Psalm 37, and our first reading in Luke 24. Let's turn now to Numbers 19. In yesterday's readings, we heard how God proved again his choice of Aaron and the Levites by causing Aaron's staff to bud and even produce almonds. And God explained to the Levites and priests that their portion was not land, as for the other Israelites, but God himself and all the gifts given to God. Numbers 19 The Lord commanded Moses and Aaron to give the Israelites the following regulations. Bring to Moses and Aaron a red cow which has no defects and which has never been worked, and they will give it to Eleazar the priest. It is to be taken outside the camp and killed in his presence. Then Eleazar is to take some of its blood and with his finger sprinkle it seven times in the direction of the tent. The whole animal, including skin, meat, blood, and intestines, is to be burned in the presence of the priest. Then he is to take some cedar wood, a sprig of hyssop, and a red cord and throw them into the fire. After that, he is to wash his clothes and pour water over himself, and then he may enter the camp, but he remains ritually unclean until evening. The one who burned the cow must also wash his clothes and pour water over himself, but he also remains unclean until evening. Then someone who is ritually clean is to collect the ashes of the cow and put them in a ritually clean place outside the camp, where they are to be kept for the Israelite community to use in preparing the water for removing ritual uncleanness. This ritual is performed to remove sin. The one who collected the ashes must wash his clothes, but he remains unclean until evening. This regulation is valid for all time to come, both for the Israelites and for the foreigners living among them. Those who touch a corpse are ritually unclean for seven days. They must purify themselves with the water for purification on the third day and on the seventh day, and then they will be clean. But if they do not purify themselves on both the third and the seventh day, they will not be clean. Those who touch a corpse and who do not purify themselves remain unclean, because the water for purification has not been thrown over them. They defile the Lord's tent, and they will no longer be considered God's people. In the case of a person who dies in a tent, anyone who is in the tent at the time of death or who enters it becomes ritually unclean for seven days. Every jar and pot in the tent that has no lid on it also becomes unclean. If any touch a person who has been killed or has died a natural death outdoors, or if any touch a human bone or a grave, they become unclean for seven days. To remove the uncleanness, some ashes from the red cow which was burned to remove sin shall be taken and put in a pot and fresh water added. In the first case, someone who is ritually clean is to take a sprig of hyssop, dip it in the water, and sprinkle the tent, everything in it, and the people who were there. In the second case, someone who is ritually clean is to sprinkle the water on those who had touched the human bone or the dead body or the grave. On the third day and on the seventh, the person who is ritually clean is to sprinkle the water on the unclean persons. On the seventh day, he is to purify those who, after washing their clothes and pouring water over themselves, 
become ritually clean at sunset. Those who have become ritually unclean and do not purify themselves remain unclean because the water for purification has not been thrown over them. They defile the Lord's tent and will no longer be considered God's people. You are to observe this rule for all time to come. The person who sprinkles the water for purification must also wash his clothes. Anyone who touches the water remains ritually unclean until evening. Whatever an unclean person touches is unclean, and anyone else who touches it remains unclean until evening. Numbers 20 In the first month, the whole community of Israel came to the wilderness of Zin and camped at Kadesh. There Miriam died and was buried. There was no water where they camped, so the people gathered around Moses and Aaron and complained. It would have been better if we had died in front of the Lord's tent along with the other Israelites. Why have you brought us out into this wilderness? Just so that we can die here with our animals? Why did you bring us out of Egypt into this miserable place where nothing will grow? There's no grain, no figs, no grapes, no pomegranates. There's not even any water to drink. Moses and Aaron moved away from the people and stood at the entrance of the tent. They bowed down with their faces to the ground, and the dazzling light of the Lord's presence appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, Take the stick that is in front of the covenant box, and then you and Aaron assemble the whole community. There, in front of them all, speak to the rock over there, and water will gush out of it. In this way you will bring water out of the rock for the people, for them and their animals to drink. Moses went and got the stick as the Lord had commanded. He and Aaron assembled the whole community in front of the rock, and Moses said, Listen, you rebels! Do we have to get water out of this rock for you? Then Moses raised the stick and struck the rock twice with it, and a great stream of water gushed out, and all the people and animals drank. But the Lord reprimanded Moses and Aaron. He said, Because you did not have enough faith to acknowledge my power before the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land that I promised to give them. This happened at Meribah, where the people of Israel complained against the Lord and where he showed them that he is holy. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. They said, This message is from your kinsmen, the tribes of Israel. You know the hardships we have suffered, how our ancestors went to Egypt, where we lived many years. The Egyptians mistreated our ancestors and us, and we cried to the Lord for help. He heard our cry and sent an angel who led us out of Egypt. Now we are at Kadesh, a town at the border of your territory. Please permit us to pass through your land. We and our cattle will not leave the road or go into the fields or vineyards, and we will not drink from your wells. We will stay on the main road until we're out of your territory. But the Edomites answered, We refuse to let you pass through our country. If you try, we will march out and attack you. The people of Israel said, We will stay on the main road, and if we or our animals drink any of your water, we will pay for it. All we want is to pass through. The Edomites repeated, We refuse, and they marched out with a powerful army to attack the people of Israel. Because the Edomites would not let the Israelites pass through their territory, the Israelites turned and went another way. 
The whole community of Israel left Kadesh and arrived at Mount Hor, on the border of Edom. There the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Aaron is not going to enter the land which I promised to give to Israel. He is going to die, because the two of you rebelled against my command at Meribah. Take Aaron and his son Eleazar up Mount Hor, and there remove Aaron's priestly robes and put them on Eleazar. Aaron is going to die there. Moses did what the Lord had commanded. They went up Mount Hor in the sight of the whole community, and Moses removed Aaron's priestly robes and put them on Eleazar. There on top of the mountain Aaron died, and Moses and Eleazar came back down. The whole community learned that Aaron had died, and they all mourned for him for thirty days. Let's turn for the second time to Psalm 37. Look for how this poem shows us God's perspective about this world. Psalm 37, starting at verse 20. But the wicked will die. The enemies of the Lord will vanish like wild flowers. They will disappear like smoke. The wicked borrow and never pay back, but good people are generous with their gifts. Those who are blessed by the Lord will possess the land, but those who are cursed by him will be driven out. The Lord guides us in the way we should go and protects those who please him. If they fall, they will not stay down, because the Lord will help them up. I'm old now, and I have lived a long time. But I have never seen good people abandoned by the Lord or their children begging for food. At all times they give freely and lend to others, and their children are a blessing. Turn away from evil and do good, and your descendants will always live in the land. For the Lord loves what is right and does not abandon his faithful people. He protects them forever. But the descendants of the wicked will be driven out. The righteous will possess the land and live in it forever. The words of good people are wise, and they are always fair. They keep the law of their God in their hearts and never depart from it. Wicked people watch good people and try to kill them but the Lord will not abandon them to their enemy's power or let them be condemned when they are on trial. Put your hope in the Lord and obey his commands. He will honor you by giving you the land and you will see the wicked driven out. I once knew someone wicked who was a tyrant. He towered over everyone like a cedar of Lebanon. But later I passed by, and he wasn't there. I looked for him, but couldn't find him. Notice good people. Observe the righteous. Peaceful people have descendants, but sinners are completely destroyed, and their descendants are wiped out. The Lord saves the righteous and protects them in times of trouble. He helps them and rescues them. He saves them from the wicked because they go to him for protection. And now let's turn to Luke 24. At the end of chapter 23, we heard the events of the crucifixion, including the miracle of the torn curtain in the temple. Jesus was laid in a tomb while the women watched, 
and the women prepared spices to go back and anoint his body. Luke 24 Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb carrying the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the entrance to the tomb, so they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They stood there puzzled about this, when suddenly two men in bright shining clothes stood by them. Full of fear, the women bowed down to the ground as the men said to them, Why are you looking among the dead for one who is alive? He is not here, he has been raised. Remember what he said to you while he was in Galilee. I, the Son of Man, must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and three days later rise to life. Then the women remembered his words, returned from the tomb, and told all these things to the eleven disciples and all the rest. The women were Mary, the one from the village of Magdala, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James. They and the other women with them told these things to the apostles. But the apostles thought that what the women said was nonsense, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. He bent down and saw the grave clothes, but nothing else. Then he went back home amazed at what had happened. On that same day, two of Jesus' followers were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking to each other about all the things that had happened. As they talked and discussed, Jesus himself drew near and walked along with them. They saw him, but somehow they did not recognize him. Jesus said to them, What are you talking about to each other as you walk along? They stood still with sad faces. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening there these last few days? Jesus asked, What things? Why, the things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. This man was a prophet and was considered by God and by all the people to be powerful in everything he said and did. Our chief priests and rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and he was crucified. And we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to set Israel free. Besides all that, this is now the third day since it happened." Some of the women of our group surprised us. They went at dawn to the tomb, but did not find his body. They came back, saying they had seen a vision of angels, who told them that he is alive. Some of our group went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, how foolish you are, how slow you are to believe everything the prophet said. Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then to enter his glory? And Jesus explained to them what was said about himself in all the scriptures, beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther, but they held him back, saying, Stay with us, the day is almost over and it's getting dark. So he went in to stay with them. He sat down to eat with them, took the bread and said the blessing. Then he broke the bread and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, 
Wasn't it like a fire burning in us when he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? They got up at once and went back to Jerusalem, where they found the eleven disciples gathered together with the others and saying, The Lord is risen indeed. He appeared to Simon. Let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your death for us, for the incredible suffering that you went through in order to purchase us for God and for yourself. You have paid our ransom, and we are so grateful. And we thank you that you proved all of this by your resurrection. We see here, Lord, that those who went with unbelieving eyes did not find you at that empty tomb. They did not see you. You said to two of your followers, How foolish you are, how slow you are to believe 